Good morning, happy Father's Day, happy Juneteenth, and welcome everyone who's here in Bethlehem, everyone who's joining us online this morning. I believe the Lord's intent for this church in this season is to do three things, to restore the joy of our worship, to rebuild a sense of community, and to release everyone into the game. You're going to hear me say that a lot because I want to repeat it enough that everyone gets it kind of ingrained. And many of you know that I shared those three points originally on the first Sunday of the opening of this decade. And it was a message called The Purposes of God. And really those three things were just my attempt at summarizing all of the prophetic words that have been spoken over this church in recent years. And so I picked up these three prophetic themes that the Lord had kept repeating over us. Um, And so... I want us to get familiar with them, but here's something that I didn't anticipate as I preached that sermon uh, two and a half years ago. We're in this series right now called Road to Renewal, and we're studying the two-part book of Ezra, Nehemiah. And what's been blowing my mind as I've been studying this book is that those three themes that have been spoken over us prophetically are actually the three main themes of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, or at least they're very strong themes within those books. And so, you know, I wish I could say I planned that, but the truth is I'm just not that good at planning. (laughs) So it's been one of those things where as I've been going through it, and and each week I've, I've been discovering this, that wow, God, you really do have something to speak to us right now. So this feels to me like one of those fresh, what we call rhema words, a word in season. And so I really believe the Lord's got something that he wants to speak to us through this, and it's exciting to be able to share it with you. So Ezra Nehemiah recounts the moment in Israel's history where after 70 years of exile in Babylon, they were finally given the chance to return to Jerusalem. And it happened in three waves of return. The first was uh, led by Zerubbabel, and it was focused on uh, the uh, the restoring, the restoration of the temple. Uh, And so it was a revival of worship. There's three waves of revival that we see. And last week we were looking at uh, Ezra's second return, 60 years later, uh, which was all about the restoration of Scripture. It was the renewing of community based on the story of Israel's history, which was Scripture. And so this week, we're looking at the third cycle of return, which is led by Nehemiah. And so we're we're not going chapter by chapter, rather by uh, section by section at each of these phases. And so today, we're going to be looking at uh, Nehemiah chapters 1 through 7. We're only going to be reading a small section of that. Um, But you see there that you've got those three things, restoration of worship, restoration of community, and as we're going to see in Nehemiah today, the restoration of the city walls, which was getting everyone released into the the work of God's kingdom. And so the title today, it's a bit more than a title. I I would say it's actually an invitation to us as a community, and the title is, Come, Let Us Rebuild. Come, Let Us Rebuild. So why don't we invite the Lord to speak today, and and we're asking him for revival in this place. So Father, as we uh, go into your word, um, we ask you that you would uh, quicken our hearts, that you would awaken our minds to everything that you want to speak to us. Holy Spirit, come and move in this place. Do it again among us. We ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, We're going to read from the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 1, and we'll read a couple other portions of the story as we go along, but let's read uh, these first few verses, and I'm going to just interject a comment or two. So starting in verse 1 of Nehemiah 1, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in Susa, the capital, one of my brothers, Hanani, came with certain men from Judah. So just to situate you in the story here, this is now 20 years after um, Ezra's second revival. This is now 20 years on. And this is uh, in the reign of King Artaxerxes, uh, and Nehemiah was Artaxerxes' cupbearer in Persia. So that's why he is still in 
Persia rather than having returned. And so a, a, a cupbearer was basically a mix between the king's uh, butler, his bodyguard, and his sommelier. <laughs> and so um, let's carry on uh, from verse 2. And it says, And I asked them about the Jews that survived, those who had escaped the, the captivity, and about Jerusalem. They replied, the survivors there in the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So, up until this point in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, we've already seen the temple restored, we've seen the people recommit themselves to Scripture, and so you would think at, at that point in the story that 20 years on, things would be doing really well. The temple, the restoration of worship has happened, you know, the people are back into Scripture, they've recommitted themselves to the covenant, and yet 20 years on here, we find that things are not going so well because there was an essential work of restoration that had still not happened, which was restoring the city walls. And so, you might think, uh, why is Nehemiah so distraught about this? This is something that happened when Nebuchadnezzar first conquered the city 150 years before this. So why is this news so troubling to him? Well, We have to understand a couple things. First of all, we have to understand the importance of cities within the Bible, and we have to understand the importance of city walls. So, first of all, cities are absolutely—I love this um, topic—but cities are absolutely essential to the story of the Bible, and in a way, you could actually paint the entire narrative of Scripture as this fight, this battle between two cities, um, Jerusalem, the city of God, and Babylon, the city of man. You see that right from Genesis where we're introduced to Babel, which is the same city as Babylon, and all the way at the end in in the book of Revelation, you see the same thing, the city of God fighting against the city of man uh, and Babel. And really, what it is is not just two cities, um, but it's, it's two visions of human flourishing in conflict. And so the question that's running through the Bible, because cities are, are, are a, a symbol of human flourishing, cities are the place where um, because you've got a, a large number of people, people are able to specialize in the things that they're gifted in. If you're a nomadic tribe or just a group of families, a small village, well, you kind of have to do everything yourself, right? You've got uh, to take care of the land and the livestock. You've got to make the tools. You've got to cook the food. You've got to make the clothes, everything. But when you're in a city, now you've got... Uh, you've got uh, people who can specialize in the farming. You've got people who can specialize in the blacksmithing and the, the, the clothing making and all those things. And the, the cumulative result is that everyone flourishes more because everyone is able to offer their gifts. And so cities are this picture of human flourishing. And yet the question that you have through the Bible is, is the best way of human flourishing in the city of God where humanity is submitted to the law and the will of God? Or is the best way of human flourishing the city of man where human beings get to decide their own way? And you have this tension, this clash running through the the, the whole of Scripture. Now, the thing about walls that we can easily miss as modern people because Virtually no modern city has city walls, but that's a very recent development. That's only really the past 150 years that cities haven't needed walls. For the rest of human history, virtually, every city needed walls. Why? Number one, for protection. Uh, In order for people to specialize and not everyone having to always be preparing and thinking about, uh, you know, war, a wall allows the people to flourish because it allows people to do uh, all the other work that's necessary Uh, for human flourishing. Um, So the first thing that a wall does is protect. It provides security, but it also provides boundaries to the city that give it an identity. The walls provide boundaries that allow you to say, this is the city, this is what it is, who belongs to the city, and who doesn't. So the walls allow you to define what the city is. And without those two things, without a wall that gives you protection, but also identity, 
well, it's very hard to develop any sense of community. Very hard to build any sense of flourishing community. And so you notice in that uh, report that Hanani gives to Nehemiah in, in, chapter, in verse 1, um, he says, because the wall is broken down, not only are the defenses of the city disintegrated, but it goes on to say the people's sense of worth, the people's sense of honor is disintegrated. And so their ability to flourish as a community, even though they'd been there already uh, with, you know, a, a temple and scripture, their ability to flourish as a community was, was held back. It was hampered because the walls were still broken down. And so the first point here, uh, very basically, is that walls provide security and identity necessary to flourish. All right? And so uh, they'd reestablished worship, they'd reestablished the knowledge of Scripture, but they couldn't flourish without a wall. And so what does this have to do with us? All right? The modern, here's how I think this applies to us. We, as the modern church, we excel at putting on worship services. We've got it timed down to the minute, you know, at least in theory. <laughs> All right? The modern church uh, has more tools and resources and books and conferences and courses that will teach you Scripture than ever before in all of the church's history. So we excel in worship. We excel in, in the knowledge of Scripture. At least we have the tools to be able to do so. But we've gone through a period where our walls have been absolutely torn down. And so we're, 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 even before the pandemic, I, I believe the pandemic has only revealed fracture lines and, and, and places of brokenness that were already evident beforehand because even before the pandemic, we were seeing record levels of, uh, you know, a, a mental health crisis, levels of anxiety, depression, a uh, 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 broken sense of community, uh, of, of relationships. And so the walls of security that make people feel uh, safe and secure and happy, broken down. The walls around society that are, exist to also provide identity, broken down. And so, even though we excel at putting on worship services and biblical studies, here's the thing. If, if the walls of a person's sense of security and identity are broken down, it doesn't matter how many worship services you attend. It doesn't, many ha it doesn't matter how many Bible studies you attend. There's a blockage in, in the heart and the mind that you can't flourish as a person. You can't flourish as a community. So I want, I want to show you how that's the case. This has massive implications for our discipleship and our community. There's, there's a, uh, a book I was introduced to recently called The Other Half of Church, and um, we're, we're part of a local pastor's network called uh, um, One Voice, and all the pastors in that are, are currently reading this book. Um, it's by Jim Wilder, and uh, he's a psychologist, and, and uh, Michelle Hendricks, who's a pastor, Mitchell Hendricks. Um, and essentially what they're talking about is uh, the way that the human brain works— is that there's these two processors. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm getting this from this book, okay? You can go read it. Um, the human brain has these two processors, these two tracks that we uh, interpret everything we experience through. The right brain and the left brain is, the, is the, the, the simplest way to conceptualize it. The right brain, many of us know about the right brain as the, the more intuitive side, the, 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 the part of the brain that handles emotions and instincts. And the left side of the brain, we know, uh, is where conscious thought and logic and language are processed. Uh, it's not really, you know, exactly right and left. Um, but that's a, a good way to conceptualize it. But here's the thing that most people don't know, what I didn't know before reading this book, is that actually every single thing that we, it, it's not like language and logic enter the left brain and the feelings and the, the touchy-feely stuff enters the right brain. Everything goes through both. But the right brain goes first. The right brain is the entry point through which we interpret and experience everything, and only once it passes through the right brain does it reach the left brain. 
So what that means is, if you're emotional, you're intuitive, the, the, in, the right side of the brain is where your, your sense of identity, uh, basic sense of security, and, and personhood, that's where it resides, mostly. It's pre-conscious. It's, it's before you, uh, you, you consciously are able to formulate those things. That resides in the right brain. And so if everything that you experience in life first passes through the right side of your brain before the left side can, can compute it, what it means is if, those, if your right brain is, is broken down in some way, if the walls of your identity and sense of security are broken down in the right brain, well, not much of anything gets to the left brain to allow you to flourish in those ways. And so the, when you apply that to the life of the church, what you find out is, think about it, almost every method and tool of discipleship that we use is left brain focused, right? Bible study, uh, home groups, what I'm doing right now, preaching, uh, you know, courses. They're all wonderful tools, but y y you may have noticed there's some people, uh, and you may be one of them, where you feel like, yeah, I've done those things for years, and yet I haven't really felt like I've been able to grow, I, 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 we, I've applied all of these tools, but the thing is, they're all left brain tools. And if you're a person who's experienced a lot of, uh, whether it's anxiety, mental uh, instability, uh, sense of insecurity, uh, or whether you're going through any sense of, of uh, questioning identity, uh, all of those things, what happens is all those left brain things don't have a chance to really uh, be, you know, help you grow. The walls first need to be built back up. And so, um, if those right brain skills are not in place and secure, it's very hard for anything to, to take root in the, in the left brain. Right? And I promise you, the whole rest of this thing is not going to be a lecture on like brain science. Um, but... <laughs> The basic point is this, we, you know, we can do all the worship services, services we can do all of the, the, the Bible studies, but if those walls of security and identity have not first been built up in a person, then their character is not going to flourish in the way that it could. Now, I've seen this growing up in, in Battelle. You know, um, Battelle, guys come in, women come in uh, to the program, and the very first thing that they experience, yes, they're in the church services and they're in the, you know, the Bible studies and that kind of stuff, but the very first thing, you, you can listen to it when you hear their testimonies, the thing that touched them was not a sermon, was not a worship service, it was the fact that someone sat up with them through the night while they were going cold turkey coming off of heroin. The fact that someone would care for them. A sense of safety is what that brings. There's someone looking out for me. And then the, the fact that there's this relational uh, investment into them as a person, it, it, it brings that sense of emotional um, um, wholeness. And it brings them to a place after a while where all of a sudden, all the stuff that they're seeing in church and hearing in the sermons and Bible studies, it starts to make sense all of a sudden. And what it, what it, you need a time where those walls can be rebuilt. And so, so here's the point. If that's true of individuals, it's just as true of communities. All right? So for a community to mature, relational and emotional walls must first be rebuilt. All right? So you can call those things, since we're talking about walls, you can call these things the structure of community. And, and, and we'll get back to that idea in a minute. But I, I want to take us back to the story here. Okay, so in chapter 2, Nehemiah, uh, we find him serving the king his wine, as, his, as was his job to do, and he's visibly distressed. And the king asks him, hey, what's going on, Nehemiah? And um, uh, he tells him, well, it's because the, the, the walls of the city of my fathers are broken down. What else could I be feeling except this, this distress? And so um, the king asks him, well... What, what is your desire? What's your request? You know, that, that's the kind of question you want someone in power to ask you. <laughs> and so Nehemiah takes the opportunity, and he says, send me back. He, you know, Nehemiah is great. Uh, he, he, uh, he's got a business plan attached 
to his feelings. He says, send me back, give me letters of recommendation, you know, give me um, the, the wood from the royal forest so that I can use it to rebuild. And so he gets permission, uh, and, and you notice there's a cycle in these two books. Um, you know, the cycle is God raises up the heart of a leader, He's commissioned by a uh, Persian king. He's sent, and he's given all the resources to do what God has in his heart for him to do. And then he gets there and immediately meets opposition. And so that, this is the cycle that we see one, two, three times. And so he's given the green light. He gets permission. He gets the resources, and he goes. And this time, what's cool is he's given a military escort back to Jerusalem. And so, you know, what's, what's happening here is just as Ezra was the new Moses, well, Nehemiah is the new Joshua going in uh, with, with the armies. And so he makes it back to Jerusalem, uh, and he's on this secret mission, and there's this really cool episode. He's, he's, he's there at night, and he rides out, and he inspects the city walls. And, um, you know, it's easy to see why there's so many books and seminars on leadership principles coming out of Nehemiah, because he's a really inspiring leader. Uh, he's not only, you know, a man of great uh, heart, um, but he's, he's well prepared. He's got a plan, um, and he's, he's, um, he's, he's a, a skilled and wise leader. And so obviously, he's being set up here as someone to emulate. Um, but I, wanna, I want you to watch what happens here. We're going to read chapter 2, verse 17, um, and this is where Nehemiah has his kind of like brave heart moment. And, he, and he, he stands up on the wall and he tells the people uh, this. So it says, uh, 2.17, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are now in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. They said, let us start rebuilding. So they committed themselves to the common good. I love that. You know, a a lot of translations, your translation may say uh, they committed themselves to the good work, but I think this is actually a better translation because there's a communal aspect to the word that's given here. And so it's, it's not just the work that's good, but it's, 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 it's work that is good for the common good. So, Nehemiah is, is this inspiring leader. But here's the thing. I think if we, if we read these books and all we get out of them is, you know, five principles for leadership or, you know, ten ways to manage volunteers, uh, <laughs> then you know, those things are good and useful, but we're, we're kind of missing the point that the biblical authors are trying to get to. Because the focus is not on Nehemiah building the wall. The focus is on the whole community building the wall. He doesn't build it. The people build it. And so, as we talk about rebuilding the walls of our community, I think there's two things that we need to, to absorb here. So, Number one, rebuilding community walls requires telling a new story. Rebuilding community walls requires telling a new story. There's an author uh, called Peter Block who's, who's an expert on, on community building, and, and one of the things that he points out is that um, communities, wherever you find a community, it's based on a shared uh, a, a sense of story, a shared architecture uh, of, of language. And so we saw this last week with Ezra's revival that the, the covenant people are built on the story of Scripture. Without the story of Scripture, there is no identity for the covenant people. All right? And so uh, what Peter Block points out then is that uh, to create a future, whenever you want to uh, have a future that is different from the past, what has to happen is you have to start telling a new story. You've got to tell a new story for the future to be distinct from the past. And the reason is our perception shapes our reality that we experience. Whatever you're expecting, the story that you tell also shapes how you experience it. It shapes your reality. And you see that from the very first sentence of Scripture. How does God create the reality that we're in? He speaks. Language shapes the universe. And we don't have that kind of power in the same way, but our language also creates realities. 
It creates realities of experience and imagination, and it creates things that don't exist um, when, we, when we speak them and share a common story. So to create a new future, we have to tell a new story. And it, it's not about telling a new story different than Scripture. In our case, as the covenant community, what it is is actually allowing the true story, the overarching story, to begin to shape our perspective so that we tell a new story about, about ourselves. So it's retelling, like we talked about last week, it's retelling the story of Scripture in each new generation. So when you look at this community in Jerusalem, what was the story that they were telling? Well, it was a story, uh, it, it was, it was a, a story about themselves that was based on deficiency. The story they were telling about themselves as a community was, well, we lack a wall. We don't have a wall. We lack uh, community flourishing. We're not in a good place. Uh, we, we lack a sense of honor. No one respects us. And so, what's the first thing that Nehemiah does? He comes in there. He doesn't say, I have this plan and I have this. He says, look, we, he inserts himself into the story. He says, we are in this state. But then what does he do? He shifts the conversation. And he says, come let us rebuild. And so, um, <laughs> He starts telling a story that's not based on deficiency, but on possibility. A story not based on deficiency, but on possibility. Because here's the thing. In, in, our, in our society, the norm is that we, we focus on areas of deficiency, right? We focus on, you know, America's a very pragmatic, very practical society. We focus on the problems and how are we going to get them fixed, right? And, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, but, but when that is the, the, the be-all and end-all of the conversation, what happens is all you're doing is you're zoning in on areas of lack. You're zoning in on deficiency. And so the conversation uh, begins to be this, right? How do we fix the problem? How long will it take? How much is it going to cost? Yeah? I mean, just watch our political dialogue. Is there anything other than that? Virtually, you know? <laughs> and so, th those, are, is, those are legitimate questions. Those are questions that have to be asked. But, if that's the only set of questions that you ask, what happens is, you never create a future that's different from the past. Nehemiah, what he does is he looks at the people and he asks a different question. He says, what can we build together? He looks at the people and says, what do we want to build together? And it shifts the conversation from deficiency to possibility. As long as a community is defined by what it lacks, it can't rebuild the walls. It took a new conversation, a new sense of possibility, an invitation into a new reality. And so, here's the second thing. So, rebuilding requires telling a new story, but secondly, rebuilding requires accepting your citizenship. Accepting the freedom of your citizenship. All right? Now, this, this could get very esoteric, but um, I don't want to go there. But, but if you think about what freedom is, what is freedom except possibility? What is freedom but possibility? A community cannot enter a new future of possibility without embracing it's freedom without embracing their, each person's role as being part of that story, just like Nehemiah did, and, and uh, as a citizen of that city. Because why, why is it important to be a citizen? Well, um, you know, if you're just a subject, the people of Israel in Persia and Babylon, they had merely been subjects, right? Subjects to an emperor, and when you're a subject, you don't have a say in how the kingdom is run. You don't have a part to play. You do what you're told. But it, notice that's not how Jesus operates his kingdom. Now, he is a king, all right? We are expected to obey, but what is it? He, he didn't just send his angels out into the world and just say, conquer the world for me. What did he do? He chose a group of people, of human beings. He empowered them. He said, you are now citizens of my kingdom, and I'm sending you out with a task 
to build it with me. Yeah? But for that to happen, you have to accept that role. It's, it's part of, um, you, you know, another, another way you could talk about it is the difference between, you know, uh, be, being a child or growing up into adulthood. Part of adulthood is you begin accepting the responsibility, not that other people will do everything for you, but that you have a contribution to make. You become the one that starts to think about providing and, and protecting and contributing to build something. And so... Um, a community cannot rebuild the walls without the people of the community accepting that sense of citizenship. Yeah? And so, you know, I'm, I'm talking here about everyone released into the game. Now, if you know the story of Nehemiah, you know that this is exa exactly what happens. They respond to him in that passage. They say, yes, let us rebuild. Right? And then uh, the very next chapter, it's, it's so cool. You see um, uh, every single member of the, 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 the remnant community pitching in to rebuild this wall. Um, so th this is what you see as Nehemiah starts to tell a different story, a story of possibility, and the people accept their own role as citizens in, in the city and bringing about that possibility. They're, they're not asking, they don't look at Nehemiah and say, okay, how long is this going to take? They don't say, uh, you know, how much is this going to cost? What do they say? They say, they, they be, it shifts the conversation. They begin to ask, what am I willing to give? How much am I willing to invest? And you, and you find out in the next chapter, they throw everything into it. And so, um, if we want to step, this is what I'm feeling for us as a church, NC4, if we want to step into what, what God desires for us as a community, we have to start telling a new story about ourselves. We have to shift the conversation. And secondly, each of us has to accept our place within that story, that we're not just subjects within God's kingdom, we're actually called citizens of heaven. And a citizen has a role to play in building society. And so that's everyone in the game is the way to sum that up. But this, you know, you notice this is not about leaders. This is not, le leaders facilitate, they bring the people together, but Nehemiah doesn't rebuild the wall. The people rebuild the wall. The community rebuilds the wall. And so this is the invitation that's before us. Our invitation is to come together to create as citizens. And so you read on in chapter 3 that those very same people who were stagnant, they were stuck, they were, they were going nowhere as a community, lacking honor, what happens? They rise up and they rebuild the city. They, sorry, they rebuild the city walls in less than two months. And their, their enemies, their opponents, were absolutely blown away by how quickly they got it done. And it wasn't just the professionals. It wasn't just the, you know, the, 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 the builders and the stonemasons. It was everyone. It was men, women, young, old, uh, every profession. And in the face of, ab, you know, absolute uh, uh, opposition, these terrible odds. And I, I love, probably my favorite verse in the whole book is uh, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, after all this, after all this opposition, it says, so we rebuilt the wall. <laughs> and all the wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Guys, when, <laughs> when the people get a mind to work, God's purposes cannot be stopped. When, when we as a community get a mind to work, when we get the mindset of citizens that we are contributing to this, Everything that God has spoken to us, it's no longer just a dream. It is a reality that we're working towards. And God will give us everything that we need. He'll clear all the obstacles. He'll give all the resources to, to accomplish what he's told his people to do. And so, um, I said, I don't think I mentioned it, but there is something here for fathers, okay? It's Father's Day, so, you know. Um, but I, I don't have to massage this to make it happen. It's, it, it's here. And, and the reason is this. Okay, we, as we seek to apply this as a church to ourselves, um, well, we're not building physical uh, city walls. Um, so what are we building? Well, 1 Peter 
2.5 says that the walls of the church are built with living stones. The walls of the church are not uh, physical stones. They are people. And so just as it's... Uh, uh, um, uh, we're, we're not building a physical wall. Rather, God is placing people in this community as a wall, a wall of defense and security uh, and, and love so that his church can flourish. Um, I believe that's part of the role of fathers. And so um, when you read the building project in, in chapter 3, you notice that there, there's uh, tons of fathers that get mentioned, this, these heads of households. And there's more going on here, I believe, than just the fact that this is an ancient male-driven society. Um, I think what we can affirm from pretty uh, strongly from Scripture is that God calls men to be fathers and women to be mothers. Not just in a biological sense, but in a spiritual sense, in a communal sense. Um, God calls men to be fathers and women to be mothers. And as a parent in the, fam- in, in, the, in the community, in the family, part of the role of a father is to be that defensive wall around a family, which helps protect it, yes, but also give it a sense of identity. And so when those things are in place, when a father is fulfilling uh, that role within the family, um, you see that families are given the chance to flourish in a way that they, they struggle to otherwise. And the same is true, I believe, when uh, men fulfill the function of fathering within a community. And so actually, that's, uh, that's the role of, we believe, of, of elders within a church community is to be um, fathers within the community. But it's not just the elders who are, who are fathering. But the special role of elders is it is protective around the church, and it's also uh, giving and shaping identity, uh, and it allows the, the, the church to flourish. And so sometimes, you, you, you know, you hear, well, I don't know who the elders are. Uh, I've never met them. Uh, you can read the website and find out who they are, but that's not the, the important thing. The important thing is that they're there. They're praying for you, for us. They're, they're, they're per- overseeing, they're watching over the church. I can say we because I'm one of them. Uh, but they're there as a wall. And so as we talk about um, uh, uh, that role of fathering, that's part of the role of every man within this community, um, that we all carry the calling of a father. And again, that's not only biologically, but spiritually as well. And as we talk about rebuilding the walls, this, um, it's a call to everyone to be in the game, but it's especially, I believe, a call to fathers to the work of rebuilding the walls of family and community. So, um, as I come to a close here, the pragmatists among us are asking, yes, Ian, but how? But how? (laughs) And so, how do we rebuild the emotional and relational walls? Because something we're observing is that those walls are definitely broken down. And something we're observing as church leaders is that, um, an indication of this, I believe, is that there's... There seems to be a weariness among us where we're not really interested in programs and courses um, and, and studies, but I am seeing a hunger for being together, for relationship, for connection, uh, for joy. And, you know, I'll give you evidence of that in a minute, but um, in that book, The Other Half of Church, this is what they suggest, and I think they're, I think they're right on. They suggest to rebuild those walls uh, emotionally and relationally, relationally there's, there's got to be uh, two things that you focus on. Number one, increasing joy. Increasing joy. And number two, strengthening relational bonds. Increasing joy, strengthening relational bonds. And so the next point here is that living walls are built with the mortar of joy and relationship. That's what binds us together as a living uh, uh, structure, living temple. And so uh, there's, there's, I'm noticing this because I'm seeing things pop up spontaneously within the community that show this desire. So let me give you a couple examples. Arnold uh, Rago uh, started game nights um, where families come together and just play together, <laughs> play games, uh, kids and adults. 
Uh, Pastor Ellie has been spearheading this thing called Experience 412, which is a monthly thing where youth and families gather in homes, they eat together, they hang out. Uh, it's, it's, it's relational uh, and it's joy-inducing. Um, past, uh, 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 um, Delena has started organizing social outings and games nights for the primetime uh, retirees group. And when we did the survey of the prime timers, the number one thing that they said was, we want to be together, we want to hang out and build relationships, and we want to have fun together. <laughs> Um, Tavilia has started hosting, uh, Tavilia Cox, who's out in our Mukunji campus, so you know, she started hosting monthly fire pit gatherings at her house and, and other people's houses. And so, you know, there's other things that are happening uh, that, that you know about that I haven't heard of yet, but I think things are popping up that show this desire that we have for renewed joy and renewed relational bonds. And someone's thinking, well, Ian, that's not very spiritual, no, it is spiritual. <laughs> it's just not left brain spiritual. It's right brain spiritual. These are the types of things that, that serve to increase our joy and, and, and strengthen relational bonds. And what happens is those walls begin to be rebuilt. A sense of community, a sense of, of joy begins to be rebuilt. And so these are strategies to minister to the right brain um, without which all the left brain tools are going to be less effective. And so I really believe that, that in the current season that we're in as a church, uh, this isn't by accident that these things are happening. Um, you know, even the elders... Um, we, we usually meet as elders every week and, you know, there's decisions to be made, there's things to pray for. And we came to the point a couple months ago where we said, we were all feeling this weariness, this tiredness. And we said, you know what? Actually, Pastor Grubby said, what you all need to do, his, his kind of like last uh, directive as, as uh, head pastor was, you all need to slow down, meet less often, meet every other week. Don't talk about business things, just pray together. Just enjoy each other's presence. And we, we've done that for a couple months now. And I got to say, um, it has b breathed a new uh, breath of life into us as a group uh, and into our meetings. And so I really believe that in this current season, the questions we need to be asking as we're, as we're thinking about what should we be doing as a church, what, what strategies, what programs, all these things, the things we should be asking are, where are we experiencing joy as a community? Where are we experiencing joy? Let's lean into that. And secondly, where are we seeing bonds of love being strengthened? Where are we seeing relationships being strengthened? Let's lean into that. Because as we do that, I believe we're, 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 we're noticing where God is at work, and we're joining in with where he's at work. And so... That does not mean getting rid of the, the left brain stuff and the Bible studies and the, and the, you know, the preaching. I'm still going to be preaching. Uh, it doesn't mean getting rid of that stuff, but what it means is zoning in on those things that will help rebuild our walls. And so uh, my invitation to you as, as the worship team uh, comes back up, um, I, actually, we've run over, so why don't I just bless everybody, okay? All right? And release you to go, you know, have a meal together and rebuild some joy in relationship. <laughs> How about that? Okay, so <laughs> my invitation to you online here is come, let us rebuild. Come, let us rebuild. And you know the beautiful thing about those strategies? Anyone can do that. Anyone can do that. Everyone gets the chance then to, to pitch into the rebuilding of the walls. So you might be here listening, you might be online, and you've, you've never committed yourself to Jesus to follow him, and maybe there's something that God's been tugging on your heart today, and I want to give an invitation. If that's you, you can simply come to him in prayer and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for how I've walked away from you, how I've done my own thing in life, Jesus, thank you that you died for me to forgive me. Thank you that you rose again so that I could have new life. 
And those things are true, by the way, for you. Jesus, please give me your Holy Spirit. I give myself to you. I commit my life to you from now on. Amen. Very simple, but those are, uh, that's an attitude of your heart that if you will shift in that direction and put your trust in Jesus, it will change everything in your life. Everything in your life, and I'll also tell you this, it'll bleed out into your family and into your community. So let's pray together as we close, and I bless you. <sighs> Jesus, we're so grateful that you've not only made us your subjects, you've made us uh, your sons. You've made us citizens of heaven, of the heavenly Jerusalem, and you've given us a task, and you've invited us to come and rebuild. And so, Jesus, as we hear that invitation today, we ask that you'd give us the courage to rebuild the wall together. That you'd give each of us a new sense of imagination, that we begin to have a, a vision of what's possible when your people have a mind to work, to do your work. And so, Lord, would you help us shift the conversation about ourselves, Lord, that where there's been a conversation and a focus on where we're lacking, of what we're missing, Lord, that you'd shift our attention to the places where you've given us fullness, the places where you're at work and, and there's an abundance happening. Lord, help us to see those things, to lean into them, and that it would shift our perspective and rebuild the walls that have been so sorely uh, broken down in our lives. And we ask you this in the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So be blessed, everyone. Uh, be released. Enjoy your day. Uh, fathers, if you're grilling or if you're going to Juneteenth celebrations, enjoy and be blessed, in Jesus' name. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of our online community today. We hope that you felt the love of Jesus throughout our time of worship and teaching. Now, if you made a commitment to follow Jesus, then we invite you to text the word Jesus to 610-816-6062. And we'll make sure that you get an info packet on the next steps that you can take to get to know Jesus better and his life-changing power and work in your life. We also want to invite you to follow, subscribe, and connect with us on social media and to contact us directly if you have any questions. Again, thank you so much for being part of NC4 today. Be blessed, and we'll see you next time.